Yeah, ready anytime. Okay. Good evening. Thank you guys for being here. Um, this is a continuation of this year's Inklings series, and tonight we're going to be talking about the Nicene Creed. Uh, this is, compared to many of the other books that we've studied, very short. Uh, we're going to be able to read the entire thing tonight. Uh, but despite its uh, size, it is historically very significant, something that I would imagine many people in this room are very familiar with. And so feel free to uh, ask questions or make corrections or have any comments throughout our conversation, uh, because as this is so historically renowned, I'm sure there are a lot of different thoughts uh, about it. But uh, just defining the Nicene Creed, beginning our conversation, uh, something I didn't know coming into this was the definition of the word creed. I always knew it was a statement of beliefs, and that's how it's grown to be defined today. Um, but originally, uh, it comes from a Greek word, symbolon. Uh, Greg and Clay would pronounce it symbolon. Uh, but it is half of a broken object fitted to another half, like a puzzle piece. Uh, for uh, identification, almost. Uh, and so you can think of a key and a lock. Uh, really, the prime example that I can think of for this would be uh, Abraham tearing a coin in two when he and Lot separated ways at Mizpah, uh, and that's called the coin of Mizpah. They would have either half to that whole. There are a lot of tropes of that type of uh, broken symbol uh, being reunited with its missing half. But this word in the Greek, symbolon, was in reference to an identifying puzzle piece of sorts. Uh, it grew to the Latin uh, symbolum and to what we have today is English symbol, which is just an outward sign of something. Uh, whether that is a representation or a foreshadowing or how we would use it in creeds, that it is a symbol of uh, more beliefs. And so by uh, ascribing yourself to the Nicene Creed, it is uh, saying that you believe in all of its contents. It is a symbol of belief, uh, but today especially is uh, almost uh, a part to a whole that by ascribing to uh, something like a Nicene Creed, you are not only claiming those beliefs, but you are adhering to many other beliefs that the same people groups that use the Nicene Creed would believe in. Uh, hopefully that makes a bit more sense as we get into the Nicene Creed exactly. Um, but creeds in general are a symbol of what we believe. Uh, originally, this two parts to a whole concept would have connotated some kind of unity um, in, in terms of specific subsets of groups, uh, it would say, uh, not just, I believe the same things as you, but we are part of the same group. We are friends, we are together. Uh, and so this Nicene Creed in 325 AD, when it was first made, uh, was an effort towards unity by the council at the time. Uh, today, this concept has grown to be unifying or essential statement of belief, and from the dictionary definition of creed, it's a set of beliefs or aims which guide someone's actions. Uh, when we look at the actual words of the Nicene Creed, we'll see that it doesn't have too much to do with our actions. There's a lot of statements of faith and belief that we have today that really dictate actions or prescribe a certain behavior. The Nicene Creed itself doesn't have much of a behavior connotation to it. Uh, and so this is kind of a modern uh, spin on creed that wouldn't have been as relevant uh, at the time when the Nicene Creed was first made. Uh, but the Nicene Creed uh, originated in 325 AD, and it's a statement strictly of beliefs. And it was developed at the First Council of Nicaea. It was meant to fully encompass what Christians believed. It was a cornerstone 
to the uh, belief of Christianity, uh, still pretty recent to the life of Christ. The church was very young at the time, but had uh, gotten a lot of traction and had grown in number pretty considerably by 325. It had also grown pretty diverse in specific uh, thoughts, uh, different beliefs of what the nature of Jesus was, the nature of God in particular. Uh, and that's what the Council of Nicaea sought to kind of rectify with the Nicene Creed. And today, I think Greg described it to me as outside of the Bible, the most significant religious text uh, in modern history. Uh, it is very formative to the development of Christianity in this world. Uh, it shows how the mainstream thoughts of Christianity have in some ways held to the basic tenets of scripture and how in other ways have had large apostasies from the truths that we see in scripture. Um, over time, if you think of a historical timeline of the church, we know that it was more or less sound at first when Jesus had taught and when the apostles were teaching and establishing the church, they had divine revelation and intervention by Peter, intervention by John in the book of Revelation that would have sought to uh, rectify a bunch of different beliefs and heresies that were going on at the time. Uh, and we can assume that there was a sound church for at least some time uh, before pretty quickly the mainstream group that called themselves Christians devolved into what is today known as Catholics. Um, and so for a large portion of history, there was a Catholic belief system. Uh, we still think there are plenty of people who believed in the truths of scripture, whether they had an identifying name or were a sizable group or not. But throughout history, there have been times where people have sought to return to a scripture-only basis of truth. And the Restoration Movement, the Reformation Movement uh, being two of those significant times as well. Um, and looking from a historical perspective, the Nicene Creed is very important because even when the mainstream world of Christianity had devolved the furthest points away from the truths of Scripture as possible. The truths that were established in the Nicene Creed were not devolved from. Uh, it put uh, almost uh, bumpers on a bowling alley of how far uh, apart we could grow from the truths of Scripture. Uh, and I think for that reason, it's very important. For that reason, it was very helpful. But we'll be able to dig into some of the specific words of it and uh, decide for ourselves how helpful, how truthful it is. Uh, it's the statement of beliefs developed at this First Council of Nicaea in 325, meant to encompass the divining beliefs of Christianity. has seven core statements, but it was refined, we'll see in a moment, in uh, 381 at another council. And that's what is predominantly referred to as the Nicene Creed today. Um, the additions and alterations made to it uh, some 60 years after the first draft uh, is what has held the test of time and what is commonly used in many churches today. Um, it has had some additions. And today in particular, it's hard to find uh, a specific verified version of uh, the Nicene Creed. Uh, it's interesting because we think about this a lot in terms of the Bible. If you think of uh, how many different translations and interpretations there are of Scripture, there are hundreds in all sorts of languages. They all have very small uh, differentiations from one another. Some of those are preferences of an interpreter or a translator. Some of those are actual doctrines that someone is trying to impose into their translation or their doctrines reflect how they translate the Bible. And so while there are many different English translations of scripture today, all with their slightly different uh, tweaks and alterations made to them. Uh, the same is true for the Nicene Creed. There are a lot of different English copies of it and different groups of uh, uh, Catholics in particular and Orthodox churches are the two groups that use it the most today. Lutherans, yep, Lutherans use it a lot. Uh, Presbyterians will use a, a, a version of it. Um, it comes in all shapes and sizes, uh, but what we'll look at is one of the most, I think, fundamental readings of the Nicene Creed, 
that many of these groups will join. This is the first draft. This is the 325 uh, edition of the Nicene Creed. So when they first came together to have the core beliefs of Christianity, this is what the council came up with. We believe in one God, the Father of the Almighty, uh, maker of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, begotten of the Father and the only begotten, that is the essence of the Father, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father, by whom all things were made, both in heaven and on earth, who for us men and for our salvation came down and was incarnate and was made man and was made man. He suffered, and on the third day he rose again, ascended into heaven. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead, and in the Holy Ghost. Almost an afterthought at the very end, uh, a belief statement of the Holy Ghost. Um, we'll see the additions that were made to it uh, afterwards, but looking at this, uh, you know, nearly 2,000 years later, and knowing the divine truths of scripture that have been preserved for us to read, we have so many records of it. Um, arguably, our uh, knowledge of the Bible would have been as strong or stronger than the people of the council who were making this uh, this statement. I think far and wide, we agree with this first draft. Looking at it just purely as a statement of beliefs, I think many of these are truths that come from Scripture, and the stresses and specific word choices, we'll look at a few of them in a moment, uh, none of this was accidental. Uh, this was determined not just to be the foundation, but also to be uh, created in response to different belief systems at the time, and so it was important that this was foundational truths of Christianity, but also worded in such a way that it protected against some false teachings of Christianity as well. But I think uh, far and wide, uh, in my opinion, they got it right the first time around. We'll see the uh, additions to it. Uh, I know this is a little bit small, um, but this is a, uh, on the left side, you can see the first draft, the 325, and then the second draft in 381, and there are some key differences. Um, it breaks it down part by part. And so the first draft where it reads, we believe in one God, the Father of Almighty, maker of all things visible and invisible. Uh, the update says we believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible. Uh, first draft reads, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, begotten of the Father, the only begotten that is of the essence of the Father, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father. The uh, rendition of it in 381 turns it into, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before all worlds, Light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father. Then it reads, by whom all things were made, both in heaven and on earth. That was shortened to say, by whom all things were made, in the revision. Uh, the original says, for who for us men and for our salvation came down and was incarnate and was made man. And the rendition says, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Ghost and of the Virgin Mary, and was made man. Uh, oh, sorry. Then it says he suffered, and on the third day he rose again, ascended. And it's much more specific. In the second draft, it says he was crucified for us under Pontius Pilate, and suffered, and was buried. And on the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of the Father. And then where it ends uh, originally, from thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead and in the Holy Ghost. Uh, it is extended uh, to say from thence he shall come again with glory to judge the quick and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And in the Holy Ghost, the Lord and giver of life, who proceedeth from the Father, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, 
who spake by the prophets in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life from the world to come. Amen. So the right half uh, of the screen is what is uh, today traditionally accepted as the Nicene Creed. Uh, this is what, when churches and church groups will use the Nicene Creed, it is the version on the right that is accepted in, almost entirely by the, the church groups that still use it today. Um, the basic tenets of the Nicene Creed, uh, as we look through for both the original and the update, is that God is the creator of all things. Creation is stressed in both of them. Uh, and then as it defines Jesus Christ, his uh, participation in creation is also equally stressed. Uh, Jesus and the nature of Christ as the divine son of God, equally considered God, participating in creation is a major focal point of the Nicene Creed. Uh, and that tells us a little bit about the conversation of Christianity at the time, that the nature of Jesus must have been a big subject of debate, something we'll look at in just a moment. Um, but with how much focus the Nicene Creed has on what and who Jesus is, uh, we know that that was a priority in this statement of beliefs and uh, arguably a point of controversy. Specifically, that Jesus suffered, died, was resurrected for our sins, and will one day judge the world. The addition uh, on the later latter uh, update uh, of the Nicene Creed uh, includes his judgment and the eternality of uh, salvation. And then the Holy Spirit as part of the Godhead seems like a footnote uh, at first. It's expounded upon a little bit in the update, but we see that this statement of beliefs really is Trinitarian. It establishes the doctrine of the Trinity, uh, arguably for the first time in a written way, uh, outside of the actual writings of Scripture. Um, I... Uh, I don't think this is the first time people believed this, but there was so much uh, conversation around the nature of the Godhead, what the Holy Spirit was, what Jesus was, that this Council of uh, Nicaea was able to succinctly boil down the nature of the Trinity and release this one huge doctrine updated some 60 years later, but that has ultimately been preserved in Orthodox and Catholic churches for quite some time now. Um, going back to our bumper uh, bumpers of heresy, uh, I think the Trinity is a really great example of a teaching that has been more or less preserved no matter how far mainstream Christianity has drifted from the truths of scriptures. While people have changed uh, many, many things, and we'll look at a lot of those in a moment, especially in the the deepest throes of the Catholic Church's reign over Christianity. We see that there have been so many false teachings, so many apostasies that have been uh, thrown into mainstream Christianity, but this uh, general nature of the Trinity more or less has been preserved ever since the beginning of Christianity, thanks in large part to the Council of Nicaea. Because while there have been so many disagreements and uh, straying from truth uh, at 325 AD, later 381 AD, uh, mainstream Christianity said this is, these are some basic truths we will commit ourselves to indefinitely. And with uh, with a lot of conversation around how close they actually stuck to these truths, uh, I think we can say pretty certainly that in a general way, uh, mainstream Christianity has held to the Trinity and to the Godhead. Uh, and I think that's in thanks part to this. Now, the update in particular uh, in 381, uh, some people call the Niceno Constantinopolitan Creed. I practice that word a lot today, um, but most of the time people just call this the Nicene Creed, uh, and, and this update is what they're referring to. There are a lot of clarifications uh, that are made, and we'll look at the comparison again in just a moment. Um, it's arguable whether these clarifications were made because they were important, if they were necessary, uh, meaning that there was controversy or different opinions at the time, or if they just saw how 
successful the original creed was that people were starting to memorize it. And so they wanted to add more helpful information for the lay Christian. Uh, we're not sure exactly why the clarifications were added, but there is a declaration of the eternal kingdom of Jesus Christ, which is pretty important. Uh, the idea that Jesus isn't uh, a one-time judge who then falls into a, a, a period of submission for eternity, but instead, as scripture indicates, that Jesus will reign at the right hand of God forever and always be in this position of uh, of authority uh, and submission to God the Father, but uh, an equal position of authority for all of time is included in the, the update to the creed. There is a definition of the Holy Spirit, and then the addition to the belief that the one holy Catholic and apostolic church uh, is what the, you know, who speaks this creed, what they believe in, as well as baptism for the remission of sins, a belief in the resurrection, which would be our understanding of heaven, that we are resurrected into a new body, um, and then eternal life. Uh, so it is not just a resurrection that is temporary, uh, even if it's filled with glory, but it is an eternal resurrection and eternal life. So... Yeah, yeah, please. They say one body Catholic thing because they, they say one one body. And when I say they might say Catholic Church, they only say one body, one universal unified church in that statement. Uh it's meaning universal church. Uh but the uh the word Catholic is in the creed. Um and so but they mean they mean one unified church. Right. And and correct me if I'm wrong, anyone who knows more about this than me, um, but I think this is what gives weight to the Catholic concept that everybody belongs to their church, you know, that there is a parish that has a, a group and then the priests are directly responsible for all those people, whether those people claim Catholicism or not. This is part of the emergency. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So... Um, and that's why I wanted to put this back up here, because while I think uh, most Bible believing Christians would agree with 90 to 100 percent of the first draft, I think it's this second draft that starts to see the creepings in of uh, personal beliefs or contemporary beliefs at the time. Um, so the differences between the two, I won't read through all of these again. Um, but as it talks about the nature of God, the nature of Jesus, um, I think this is very agreeable. It omits uh, the only begotten, the essence of the Father, God of God. Sorry. I think it omits that maybe for brevity. Um, adds uh, begotten of the Father before all worlds, light of light, very God of God. Still things that we would agree with. The key word being consubstantial with the Father. We'll look at that in just a moment. Uh, by whom all things were made, we would all agree in. Um, and then we start to see some of the things that we would poke at. Uh, really at the end is where they add uh, the one holy Catholic and apostolic church that we would have uh, some conversation around uh, of what that means. Oh, yeah, yeah, I skipped past that, didn't I? Yeah, incarnate by the Holy Ghost and the Virgin Mary and made man. Um, so co content-wise, I think we would agree that is the nature of Jesus, but we can start to see some of the, the personality of the Catholic Church coming in and this uh, kind of excessive glorification of Mary being put into, uh, I mean, this is a statement of beliefs about the Godhead and very little else. And when they start to add anything to that discussion, the first thing that's being added to this conversation of the priority of the Godhead is the Virgin Mary. Um, and so while I wouldn't agree with the, the content of it, I think the, the weight of putting Mary into this conversation um, might be a precursor to their belief in, in Mariology and, and how excessively they uh, tend to promote and almost worship. Um, I don't know, if maybe actually worship. I don't know if it's almost. Um, so I don't know if at the time it would have been, uh, you know, as much as their worship of Mary. 
but uh, definitely a precursor to it. Um, and then, uh, funny enough, I think we would agree with most of the rest of it, the one baptism for remission of sins, uh, the resurrection of the dead, and the life of the world to come. Um, and so while there are a lot of additions, uh, I think uh, it's just a, a question of when do you stop making additions? You know, when do you decide what is important enough to put into this creed and uh, when don't you? Because if you and I are asked to make a simple statement of beliefs of the nature of God, the nature of Jesus, the nature of the Holy Spirit, I don't know if we would put Mary into our description. Um, but, you know, most of this we would still agree with, with the major exception of the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. Um, we didn't say that good thing. Yeah, I, I think at the time well, we, could. we wouldn't. Yeah, I think it, I think it was just the one holy universal church, and it was the apostles, you know, built right. on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, but again, what it developed into, mm -hmm. putting a capital C instead of a small C. Right. Yeah, so that would be the big difference in interpretation yeah. today. So, I mean, the, yeah. When it was written, I think if we were sitting around the table, we, I think we would have been fine with everything. I'm guessing. Yeah. No, I don't hope so. Um, and I think that goes to the origin of the Nicene Creed. Uh, the, the need for creed is the next couple slides. Um, but I think this is something that, generally speaking, was done with very positive intentions. Um, and so I like what, what Clay is saying, that if you and I were sitting around the table, we would agree with, you know, most, if not all of the conversation. Um, I, I agree with that statement. Um, some people argue that the creed was made to make it easy on the lay Christian, that there's just a short statement of beliefs. The average person uh, would have had a hard time reading if they could read fluently, definitely would have had a hard time getting access to scripture. And so instead of having the luxury that you and I have today of having the entire set of God's divine beliefs given to us in text, um, it was it was sermons over time. Uh, it was uh, apostolic revelation for those who had lived in the time of the apostles, uh, but was just memory from what you had heard at church. And so some people argue that this creed was developed so that it it shortened what you needed to memorize so that you could have easy doctrine, uh, a good understanding of the nature of the Godhead and move forward in your Christian walk. Um, I think that might be part of the reason. I think that's definitely the reason for its popularity and why it lasted for so long in history. But uh, my opinion is that the creed was mostly made and edited in response to significant, significant heresies. Um, and it's pretty funny, you see the biggest developmental landmarks of Christianity are always in response to a crazy person with bad ideas. Um, the, the Bible, uh, the canon of scripture, uh, was made largely in response to someone who had really bad ideas about the order that the books should be in and which books should be included in the canon of scripture. Um, I think for... And this is outside the scope of our conversation tonight. But for a long time, there were just a bunch of floating letters from apostles that people understood were inspired by God and were helpful for our understanding of the way that God works and the way that we should live our lives. And it didn't seem like people really felt the need to put that together into one binding document that we know of today as the Bible until someone did it wrong. Um, and so it was in the response to heresy that uh, a lot of productive steps were made in faith. And I think the same is true for the Nicene Creed. There were significant heresies all ar really around Jesus. There were lots of heresies. There always have been and there always will be. Uh, and so they weren't the only ones at the time, but significantly around understanding the life of Jesus Christ. There were very significant heresies. And I think that's what really made the importance of the Nicene Creed and the wording of it in particular. Uh, one belief uh, is called Arianism. Uh, it's a heresy that claims Christ was not totally God, but was made by God. 
There are different versions of Arianism. Some people believe that in the beginning was God the Father, and then God created God the Son. Um, and that carries an eternal connotation of authority uh, between the two of them. Some people believe that Jesus didn't exist until he was incarnate in the flesh, um, and that God was born of God, but before then he didn't exist. We know that that's false based off the writing of John that claims clearly in the beginning was the word and the word was God and the word was with God. Um, and so we, you know, we know that this is a, a false doctrine, but the average lay Christian at the time may not have been that educated. They may not have remembered the time that John was read to them, however long ago in church. Uh, they might not have access to read the book of John and his truths. Um, and so in particular, the Nicene Creed says begotten and not made. Uh, it is very clear that Jesus was begotten by God, but was not made by God, uh, claiming he was an eternal being, is an eternal being. Uh, Gnosticism being another one, there were lots of uh, different kinds of Gnosticism, but one of the Gnostic beliefs was that Jesus was entirely spirit and that he was not incarnate. Um, again, if you have the Bible, you have the writings of 1 John this time that begin with, um, you know, this is written by, you know, we who saw Jesus, who, who saw him, looked uh, on him with our eyes, who smelled him, who touched him, who talked with him. All of these empirical words about our relationship that the apostles had with Jesus Christ, making it very clear that he was a living, breathing human in addition to the eternal God. Um, but if the average lay Christian didn't know that, and definitely in response to this growing belief of Gnosticism, it's very clear in the Nicene Creed that Jesus was incarnate and made man. And so there is no room for debate in this statement of belief that uh, the argument of Gnosticism is false. I'm going to read a block quote that I found um, that speaks to how the Nicene Creed fought against heresy in particular. I thought it was interesting. It says, Thomas Aquinas stated that the phrase for us men and for our salvation was, this phrase meaning the Nicene Creed, um, was that the phrase for us men and for our salvation was to refute the error of Origen, who alleged that by the power of Christ's passion, even the devils were to be set free. He also stated that the phrases stating Jesus was made incarnate by the Holy Spirit was to refute uh, the Manichaeans so that we may believe that he assumed true flesh and not a fantastic body. And he came down from heaven, uh, That those words he came down from heaven, was to refute the error of Photius, who asserted that Christ was no more than a man. Furthermore, the phrase he was made man was to exclude the error of Nestorius, according to whose contention the Son of God would be said to dwell in man rather than to be a man. A um, little dense to look through all of that, but ultimately Thomas Aquinas is an early church father. Um, he was a Christian from a long time ago, and his belief af after looking through the Nicene Creed and, and reading through it, his um, his written statement about it points out a bunch of specific phrases and how those fought against specific heresies of the time. And so we can be pretty confident that every word of this creed was chosen very deliberately. And especially in the uh, kind of update to it in 381, that all of the additions were chosen very deliberately and uh, in response to beliefs at the time. Nothing was added on a whim. Uh, the impact on the Nicene Creed uh, on to the world, it's perhaps second to the Bible in religiously significant texts. Uh, it is positive, and in a lot of our conversation so far, we've been talking about the positives of it. Um, it has really positively impacted mainstream Christianity by giving it a backbone. Uh, that while the mainstream church had drastically fallen away from the truths of scripture for a very long time. Some of the core truths that they hung on to were the nature of the Trinity. Um, but there is a critical examination of it as well. Uh, and I think to look at it critically, 
the biggest issue that I perceive and what people have talked about for a long time is just the creation of the Nicene Creed itself. Uh, the concept that people can come together and decide what everyone should believe is obviously a little bit problematic. Now, when they do it about these core fundamental truths that are revealed in scripture and that everyone who calls themselves a Christian ought to live out in their lives, especially the first one that are the very fundamental truths about the nature of the Trinity. Uh, people don't complain too much, uh, but that creation of the creed is one of the many events that gave birth to the apostasy and that should be a Catholic or a, a capital C uh, of, of Catholicism. Um, these committees coming together and deciding essentially what is truth. And we can look at their first uh, councils and think they got it right. You know, they were deciding what is truth, but they picked out correct truths from scriptures. And so I have no problem with this creed. But eventually, these same councils uh, are what gave weight to the concept of bishops and archbishops and cardinals. These same councils are what gave weight to the concept of popes and what eventually led to the concept that man can create truth. Uh, and they phrase it differently when the Catholic Church does it. And But historically, we see that it is this concept of people coming together to decide what's best for everyone else. People coming together to decide the truth that led to some of the darkest times, I think, in the history of Christianity, where the mainstream uh, church was the furthest away from the truth of scripture uh, that we've seen in 2000 years. Um, so looking at it critically, we might agree with the contents of the creed, um, uh, with the exception of the Catholic Church. Uh, if, if you know lowercase c versus uppercase c, um, you know, that's arguable. But many conservative Christians will reject the use of the Nicene Creed and any creed in general on the basis of that it is at best scripturally redundant and it is at worst heresy. Uh, if you look at any statement of belief that we are going to hold to, that we are going to repeat and we're going to parrot, um, you know, today there's no reason to. If we're all going to read a statement of beliefs in church as part of our worship, we would all read a psalm together. You know, we all have the divine revelation of complete truth throughout all of scripture. And so the idea that we need to do this with statements of belief that are written by people, um, especially at this point in history, when we have copies of the Bible so well preserved, is at best redundant. Um, and then when you look at the actual contents of it can be much worse than that. Uh, formal creeds outside of the Nicene Creed are, are pretty unpopular today. The Nicene Creed and the Apostles Creed are really the only two that are used on a, on a wide, widespread basis. Um, there are different religious groups uh, that use a bunch of, of liturgies and creeds, and when they do, they'll, they'll use much more than the Nicene. Um, but uh, most religious groups still have creeds, and they just call them different things. Uh, it might not be universal like the Nicene. It might not be exactly memorized in the same way, and it might not be part of their worship, but almost every religious group will still have creeds, formal declarations of what we believe. And if you worship with us, if you are a member with us, if you say you are one of our people, then uh, it is a reflection of what your beliefs are as well. Um, some people will have this uh, very, very much broadcast in their uh, in their church and in their group, others will have it a little bit more quiet. Um, I think of the Mormon temple in town that just opened not too long ago. I walked through it uh, when they let the heathens walk through the temple. Um, and this one's in Hilliard. Um, it, this was last fall, I believe. They had just finished construction, and before they put it into use for the Mormon church, they let anybody walk through. 
there was a little donation tray. I think it was, it was a fundraising effort. But after the two or three week period, I forget how long it was, they closed the doors. And now no one is allowed in except for uh, devout Mormons. Um, it was really interesting to hear the word choicing that people used. Uh, every single person that we talked to had some pretty similar uh, words and phrases that they would defer to. And then there was one video in particular that talked about different beliefs and different systems of the Mormon church. Um, and I think you could look at that entire video and call it a creed. It might not be formal. It might not have been memorized and repeated by so many of their members, but it was a video defining and stating the different things that they believed. Um, some groups, like I would argue the Mormon church, are uh, more well known for their creeds. There is a definitive set of beliefs that uh, in theory, every church that calls themselves Mormon that identifies as part of that group should share virtually thought for thought the same belief system as the overall organization. Uh, the churches of Christ obviously operate a little bit differently. There is clear autonomy between churches of Christ. And so there can be different belief systems between each one uh, in the same way that within a church of Christ, there is a, a degree to which members can have different sets of belief. You know, we, I think, still have creeds, and I'll actually post one on the screen. Uh, this is from our church website. This is our statement of beliefs. And uh, uh, my favorite part of this is that there is scripture associated with every single one of these beliefs. But when you look through, um, it is not a comprehensive list of what we believe, but it is a general list of the most important things that we believe. So that anyone looking at, in this example, our website, can know that if they visit our church, this is what they can expect. The key differences, in my opinion, is that any creed or statement of belief posted by a church like ours or posted by a healthy Bible-believing congregation first are going to have scripture associated with all of their beliefs. And then uh, the specific beliefs that they list, uh, I think, are interesting. It shows you what is a priority and what is important to the church. For the example of the Nicene Creed, the only things they talked about at first was the Trinity. And it showed what was important to those early mainstream Christians. Uh, the additions that they had afterwards, again, reflect their priorities. And so seeing the Virgin Mary is interesting. It shows the priority of the people at the time. Um, when you look through a website like ours, you'll see what the priority is of our church and uh, the different beliefs that we've chosen to put here. Um, but uh, another key differentiating feature, in my opinion, is that, and I don't know if this is listed on our website, but I don't think uh, by posting these beliefs on our website, we are saying uh, for a fact, every member of our church believes these exact things. Um, more autonomous churches uh, or just churches that have uh, less dictative doctrine uh, will understand and uh, acknowledge the fact that individuals have some bandwidth that they can believe different things on. Now, obviously, if there is what we would call a matter of fellowship, that they would have a different belief than we do, that is so significant that it pertains to salvation or uh, determines whether or not we can have fellowship with you, then we should be on the same page about that piece of doctrine. Uh, and if we're not, then we're either, you know, we don't know what the person believes or they're being quiet about what they believe. Um, but we're not uh, having a comprehensive uh, statement of belief that we force everybody to sign into versus what other uh, Christian groups will use as creeds are meant to be a bit more comprehensive than a lot of the things that we've put on and are meant to be prerequisites for membership. Um, again, specifically thinking of the of the Mormon church, there are a more extensive set of uh, beliefs associated with it, especially creeds uh, is what we would call it in our conversation tonight. And to uh, gain status in the Mormon church, you would have to believe 
virtually all of it. You would have to be doctrinally synonymous with uh, leadership and authority and the statements of belief that they've made. Uh, whereas in more autonomous churches, there is uh, whatever is considered uh, the most important is what they would uh, require there to be some u- unity on. But then as it gets beyond that, and every church will have a different line of where they draw fellowship and what they think is salvational, what they think isn't. But as things get into um you know, less significant, isn't the best word, but the only one I can think of at the moment, less significant issues, there is more room for disagreement uh, within within a congregation. Um, this is where at least I'll end off with us. Uh, I think there might be a couple more thoughts with us today, um, but it's important to be able to articulate succinctly what we believe And I think for that reason, creeds can still be pretty important. Um, But there just needs to be a bit of a realization about what we're doing with a creed, uh, a belief. You know, if if you're confused about a basic tenet of what the Bible says about an important topic, you can honestly go to our church website or a number of church websites that have scripture set aside that says this is what we believe and this is why we believe it. This is the scriptural truth behind it. And so if you're confused about something, this can be a great uh, brief resource for your knowledge and edification as a Christian. I think there should be caution when we allow creeds or belief systems to become rhetoric. If there is such a perfect way of phrasing something that we use it over and over again, and we start not to think about the words that we're saying, and instead we just say it because it it is true and it sounds good, that means it has less of an impact on our minds and on our hearts as we say these truths of scripture, and there should be caution around that. There should be criticism when a creed becomes self-sufficient, when it is without scripture, it stands on its own and it is a functional part of your belief system or of your worship. Uh, if it is required in your worship, I think that is, again, uh, a pause for some severe caution. Uh, if you are requiring anything outside of the Bible, that is problematic. And if you are saying, here's a great way of, of how to pray or uh, how to make a statement of repentance. And when people are trying to repent, you say you must phrase it this way because we thought of it however many years ago, and it's a great way to say it. It's an issue when you say must. And then if it's part of the religion itself. Uh, One of the best examples uh, that I can think of of this concept, it's not exactly creeds, but the songs that we sing. We sing songs Oftentimes we sing songs over and over again. I forget what the most common song sung at our congregation is. Clay does a a write-up every year. Is it Hallelujah, Praise Jehovah? One year it was Zion's Call. Really? We sing that more than any other song. Okay, wow. That's the one that kind of stood out to me. Yeah. But but invitation songs, those those tend to be a high percentage because... yeah. There's only so many to choose from. Yeah. So, but Hallelujah, Praise Jehovah is very high. Yeah. Yeah. So, for our songs, I would put them into this same conversation where I think they're beautiful. I think they're wonderful. I think a lot of them have truths that were revealed in scripture that are put into our worship in a wonderfully meaningful way. When we uh, sing these songs, and they're becoming rhetoric, and we're not focusing on the words, but they just sound pretty, and we we like how it sounds when we sing it, and so that's why we come back to it, and we're not engaging critically in those songs. I think that's an issue. Um, if a song ever becomes a requirement, I think the closest is A Common Love that uh, <laughs> we sing often every night at the end of camp i sing a common love i love that song and i sing it at i think appropriate times for it greg does the same at the beginning of our worship 
Um, but let's say at one Sunday we don't sing that song and someone comes forward and says, this is a huge issue and I have a spiritual problem with the church for not singing that song today. That's obviously an issue. And uh, when it's when the song... Came forward. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but when it outgrows its usefulness uh, is when it can be a problem. When we're not engaging with the worshipful components of it, or when we are making it um, so much a part of worship that it is a mandatory part of worship, I think that can also be an issue. Um, so just because it has the word creed in it, I don't think we should be afraid of it. I don't think we should be uh, you know, worried about uh, incorporating at least its truths into what we teach today. But again, with how much truth we have in scripture and has been preserved and in our hands and in our seats today, um, I don't know if there's as much of a need for it. Um, I do have a quick note about the Apostles' Creed. Um, just, I thought it was relevant with our conversation. The Apostles' Creed is the second most popular creed uh, in the history of Christianity. It is a shorter, basically, I believe statement uh, of what the Nicene Creed is. It is a personal profession of faith. And while it's less widely used, it is very popular. I think the most restrictive, but also one of the more common usages of it is that people will say the Apostles' Creed before their baptism. Uh, when they are making the good confession instead of the way most churches of Christ do it, which is some variation uh, of, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the son of the living God? Um, you know, that is essentially what we have before our confession that leads into baptism. Uh, they'll say the entire Apostles' Creed. Uh, I'll put it on the screen. It says, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary, who suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried, descended into hell, which is an, uh, an argument that people would have. Um, but, uh, and and that is one piece that in different English translations, even today, they will have in different places or removed. There's a big uh, conversation of the translation of this passage, whether it is into the depths, which could refer to death or specifically into hell. But moving on, it says, rose again from the dead and on the third day ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, who will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Uh, interesting to have this as a confession before your baptism. Uh, I think the information that it is espousing is is important, is relevant, um, with the with a couple of argumentative points that we may have with it. Um, but it's also interesting to make all of this knowledge prerequisite to salvation. Uh, because when we look through the example of the New Testament, it seems the only prerequisite information is the life, deity, and death of Jesus Christ. And that's it. And when we start to get into the territory of demanding a an accurate belief in the church and what communion is and forgiveness of sins. I would argue we should know before our baptism, uh, but resurrection of the body, life everlasting. These are fundamental things that I would hope most people making the decision to become a Christian would understand at least to some level. Uh, but when you make prerequisites where the Bible does not make any, it was obviously an issue. Um, this is the Nicene Creed. I'll leave it on the screen for your reference. Uh, but do we have any uh, questions or additions to our conversation? Yeah. Um, it depends, I guess, on on the semantics of it, how you define it. Um, I I define it as heresy. Personally, um, I think the big difference is that uh, when it was written, the argument is that it was divinely inspired. 
Um, and so they're not claiming that it's a, a set of beliefs. Uh, when we look at what the Mormon church believes, it will be the source of their beliefs. But I think their statement of beliefs, when you look at their website, um, that's what I would refer to as their creeds more than the Book of Mormon itself. Yeah, John. As there's a little vision of creating one, was there as different beliefs came into different churches start doing different things, did they ever attempt to meet again? Was it important or yeah, so from a historical standpoint, I'm not sure. Um, I know there are uh, at least a hundred different English translations, um, and usually the English translation uh, is different because of a doctrinal belief. Uh, and so it's an interpretation from uh, one language into another, but the differences are uh, a person who has one doctrine will interpret it this way, and a person with a different will interpret it the other way. Um, so there are a lot of revisions that have been made, uh, but not a single unifying revision in the same way from 381. Yeah. From a historical standpoint, I'm not sure if that's because it was thwarted or if there was an effort to. Um, pragmatically, I would look at it as the there is less power uh for the pope if you continue to update the the nicene creed as opposed to say we'll keep this and then have papal authority the, the that council would pass what we'll say. yeah hmm. um, yeah that's an interesting thought yeah I, I, me yeah I, 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 I was thinking about the songs as well and that you know that we and and it's a reason for us to be very careful about what we're singing as mm -hmm. well. Because we are, not just for the reasons you said, that something can become so habitual that we're not thinking about it, but also just making sure that it's proclaiming truth. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, that we're not, you know, helping ourselves to start believing a falsehood. Yeah. You know, by singing a song that has uh, a questionable theology in it or yeah. something. Well, and I know people who make fun of the churches that take a, a red stamp and go through a songbook and stamp out the ones that they don't like. I didn't know uh, it was. <laughs> oh, I've seen the stamps. Um, but but I think there is some wisdom in the concept of being really careful about the you know oh, the yeah. songs that we choose. Yeah. yeah. There's the famous edition of Scarred Selections. <laughs> also in the Sacred Selections. And they modified songs. Really? Yeah. That's funny. Yeah. Yeah, so that's when we all get to heaven. Yeah. That's when the saved get to heaven. Oh. Because they didn't, they couldn't believe everyone in there. <laughs> oh. That's funny. Yeah. yeah. No, whenever I've sung that, I've, I've always thought I meant all. As in all the church. All the yeah. 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 Uh, I, yeah. Another place that we, uh, and this has just been with, I think a few times I've had to sign that I believe certain things, but Jennifer mm -hmm. switched schools this year. Mm -hmm. um, she's now a tree of life as opposed to sunshine. And at both places, she had to acknowledge that she believed a set of beliefs. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, and in that, in that kind of case, you know, a school board or a committee, yeah. you know, they want to make sure their teachers mm -hmm. believe in the Father, Son, and Spirit and believe in both schools. It was required to believe that baptism was for the forgiveness of sins. Mm -hmm. So that's good. Yeah. I mean, just, just the, so she didn't have to recite it and they don't say it every day, but she had to acknowledge certain yeah. things. And I think I've had to do that. I can't remember where I've had to do that. Maybe even just to uh, do a recommendation. Yeah. Someone going to a school. Or oh, yeah, that makes sense. yeah, I think we tend to shy away from creeds because they're used by church groups that we don't have fellowship with. Um, but in reality, when you boil down what a creed is, um, I think there's not a reason to be afraid of one. Um, 
And then arguably a lot of little things that we do that we could call credits. But we just need to be cautious about all of it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, and the, the biggest part of this conversation is, is the beauty of the Bible and how important the translation and transmission of Scripture has been that, uh, you know, in terms of creating beliefs, we don't need to anymore. That, you know, it's right there. Um, and so the scripture citations around creeds, I think, are, are the most helpful thing today. Yeah, which is why we need to have paper copies of these Bibles. Because yeah. uh, electronic copies, even with an app. Mm -hmm. I mean, times can the, the app can be changed. You know, the text can be changed in the app, and you wouldn't even know it. Yeah, and a lot of Bible translations have quit having year revision marks and their fluid translations now, possibly. which is awful. Yeah, I mean, have you been talking to Greg? Well, I don't know how you can. I don't know how you can memorize scripture to no. use in a in a sermon anymore. It's really, yeah, really tough. yeah, too irrelevant. Stuff like that. Oh yeah, I'm working on our next. What songs do we sing? Oh. I'm working on that nice. to get our new list. And then, if any of the rest of you saw, there there was a mistake in our beliefs. <laughs> oh, is there content? But I'm going to go fix that. Um, it's just a formatting error. You can read that font. Uh, so I can so read it good enough to know the number four. Oh, there's a missing parenthesis. And, uh, yeah. So yeah. Mm. Yeah. 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 That's funny. So, yeah. so I'll get on there. And yeah. that. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. Oh, it says made in Taiwan. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Any other thoughts or questions? Okay. Thanks, oh, yeah. Thank you, guys. Um, Clay, would you mind closing us in a prayer? I will not mind at all. Okay. God, we thank you so very much for all your blessings. We thank you for these times we can get together and look at various pieces of literature from, uh, from history, uh, sometimes more recent, uh, sometimes far back, and and relate it to our Christianity, to our culture. And, and we really appreciate uh, Landon doing this tonight. And we appreciate the fellowship we share and being together. Uh, Father, we pray all this in the name of Christ. Amen. Mm -hmm.